Good morning and welcome to Behind the Cloud. I'm David Clark and I manage technology development here at Workday. I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Holger Mueller, who is Vice President and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research. He has a long background in senior leadership positions in strategy and technology at companies like NGA, FICO, and a small uh, regional German software provider called SAP. Welcome, Holger. Hey, good to be here, David. Yeah, good to have you here. So um, we're both European, so um, obviously we've got to lead off with Brexit. So I'm just curious about your take on Brexit and what does it mean? What does it mean for the technology industry specifically in Europe? No, I think it's a tremendous opportunity if you look on the bright side of things, right? Because the mm -hmm. uh, UK for like every EU member for a long time had to bake in all the EU regulations, which are frankly a compromise. And now you have a 60 plus million economy, if you count the Scottish still in, uh, which sits in front of the 300 million plus in the EU. And they could be more modern, more adequate, more appropriate for the 21st century, how to do business. So it's an offshore location, which is near shore, mm -hmm. which Europe always dreamed of to a certain point um, and uh, getting that right from a legislation perspective is a huge opportunity for the UK. Yeah, people are more conscious about data residency, like where the data lives, where, where, where it's accessed from, where it's stored. What are you seeing yeah. in terms of trends around data residency? It's a great business development thing. Right? Mm -hmm. If you mandate all your data to be in country mm -hmm. and you're a large enough country, you might get the substantial part of the data center hosting mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. into your country. Mm -hmm. So I think that will be an equation in the next years, which will be very difficult for providers right. in that space to say hey, data centers everywhere right. where everybody's making up, but also very hard for the software vendors because you have to figure out how you do this mythical slice and dice right. of data to be constantly compliant. Mm -hmm. But what does it even mean for data to be resident in a country if it's being accessed from all over the world? And it's a huge software architecture challenge, which has not been solved in the past because we're used to, okay, set up roles, mm -hmm. right? You can see these things or these things, but mm -hmm. it's very, very rigid, right? right. You're in the country, yeah. wake up the next day, <laughs> and what happened to the data? I saw yesterday, I say, oops, we had a little change. Yeah. <laughs> we had an update, something changed yeah. the legislation. No work today. We, we didn't figure out that you were European with a US right. uh, visa yeah. sitting oh. in Singapore. <laughs> yeah, but it could be that the policy is sort of running ahead of the technology really in, in this way. It could, could be running ahead, but in general, that's the interesting thing is right? technology can do more what business best practice mm -hmm. can do, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have this void of new best practices, mm -hmm. but it's even bigger when it comes to legislation, mm -hmm. right? So legislation is always behind traditionally. Mm -hmm. And if technology in general moves so fast, that the gap is going to be even bigger. And the question is, when will it catch up to that? If you look to, to IoT as an example, there's nothing on the legislative side thinking about IoT right. at the moment. It will have to catch up at some point. Mm -hmm. So moving on from data privacy considerations to the cloud itself, we talk about the cloud a lot here. Yeah. Um, you're a longtime observer of the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just interested in what characteristics of the cloud you've seen evolve most rapidly over the last you know, five or 10 years, um, and which ones you think are most yeah. critical for enterprise use. I, I think the um, miniaturization of the need of compute is the big change. And now we are at the age of microservices where very tiny loads of compute can be dedicated and ramped up very, very quickly. So all the modern uh, questions that we have in applications around artificial intelligence or more, more appropriately machine learning, which it really is at the moment, uh, speech recognition, simulation of scenarios, benchmarking, getting more data in on a limited time, all rely on this miniaturization of compute, mm -hmm. which we didn't have in the past. And how do you think public clouds are helping mm -hmm. with this? Obviously, many vendors ourselves, Workday included, are looking at migrating workloads yeah. and production workloads to the public cloud. How do you think the public cloud can help the public cloud is so big because um, you can move those loads beyond your own capacity, right? Mm -hmm. If you you need less capacity overall, it's mm -hmm. more potentially even environmentally friendly because you need less service right. uh, when all of this pans out. But you have access to much more capacity on a compute perspective when it peaks. Mm -hmm. So that that's the interesting thing. And if you ask me, put a pistol on me and say, what's the one characteristic of the cloud? That's the elasticity. Mm -hmm. so, do you see any difference within companies as to what workloads they're willing to put in the public cloud? It, it used to be that companies would keep things which were more proprietary, confidential, like R&D systems, financial data, HR data closer to their chest. I mean, largely kudos to you guys. HR data has moved more to the cloud than before. Um, 
I think there's no limit at the moment anymore because what people have realized, my example is always in the financial area, right? Mm -hmm. CFO data, financial data, why move it to the cloud? Mm -hmm. And then the CFO hears, whoa, somebody, my colleague in the industry can answer these answer questions from the financial analysts mm -hmm. so much better. Right. How do they do it? And they use some of these on the cloud vendors mm -hmm. who simulate two, 3,000 scenarios. So mm -hmm. there's not even enough financial analysts to go through all of them. Whereas mm -hmm. the traditional on-premise technology do that. If the CFO's financial relations team would work all night, they would have three scenarios. And all of a sudden, whoops, the financial data was in the cloud because the CFO said, I can't afford to look bad right. and not have these scenarios. Yeah. Do you think companies need to have or should have a, an explicit strategy on public cloud adoption? Or do you think it's better that it just emerges? I think in 2017, you need to have a strategy in regards of uh, public cloud for the reason that you don't know what your business processes will be in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. uh, you might have to build some own software in areas where you want to strategically differentiate yourself mm -hmm. and there you need the cloud qualities of massive compute available to mm -hmm. do more scenarios and if you're not doing this you're strategically at risk of getting overtaken mm -hmm. digitally disrupted mm -hmm. by anybody else who's more innovative and mm -hmm. thinking about using the public cloud in our consumer lives we're very happy to share lots of information and we realize that we benefit from that mm -hmm. you shared your ways right. and status with us on the way down here this morning but um there's been a bit more reluctance to do that in business, but again, there's clear advantage if, if companies can share data benchmarking. So what, what yeah. future do you see for that? I, I think the cloud, because data is there, will help massively on the benchmarking side, because frankly, business don't know where they stand. There's been some benchmarking some point on traditional old systems, but um, now you can say every 10, 20 transaction, I share a neutralized way for some benchmark in return. I know where I'm standing. So I think the public cloud infrastructure and being there will make benchmarking much more interesting. Mm -hmm. Also, not just giving and taking, but from a DAS, from a data as a service perspective, to get interesting data, to get better insights, to complement my own data. And I'm predicting that the data as a service provider is giving this, saying, hey, David, wait a minute. You, you might have some interesting information utilized about how much you, say, pay people somewhere. Mm -hmm. Don't you want to make some extra money back for more credits from us right. to get more data um, and, and share some of that in a neutralized way or fashion? So I think there's going to be a lot of more data movement first on the data as a service space, mm -hmm. which then will benefit the benchmarking space. Right. Yeah. Do you think companies might find out things that are surprising to them? Like, obviously, every company thinks they're above average. Everybody's great, right? It's great. The Lake Wobegon <laughs> effect. But you think yeah. there's, that would be a good thing, I guess, if companies realize that. Right. You know, the sooner you know there's a problem, the better, right? The days of uh, putting your head in the sand like the ostrich or so for business uh, right. are over. over. Yeah. yeah. So I guess moving from DAS to PaaS, I mean, mm -hmm. every self-respecting cloud company these days has a PaaS strategy. Hopefully. So, but I guess... More specifically, from an application point of view, looking at BPaaS, so the yeah. idea of business process as a service, what sort of interesting innovations do you see in that area? What what business processes do you think are most suitable to be offered as services? In yeah, the cloud? well, well, and anything which enterprises want to use in an easier, more consumable way, right? BPaaS is PaaS with an API on top of that, and maybe with some services. Mm -hmm. And there's still things which, especially in the HR space, if you think of BPO there, which need some hand-holding, payroll, think about it, hiring, recruiting. Uh, which can be outsourced. Mm -hmm. And around that, all the providers are doing a lot of work on the BPAS area. The mm -hmm. challenge is, though, when the best practices change. And that's mm -hmm. what we see that for the first time back to the cloud, mm -hmm. with free compute, with free simulation capability, with unlimited storage, which doesn't cost anything anymore. You can offer new and value-added services, and this means business practice innovation. Mm -hmm. And that pulls the BPAS part a little bit back, because if I don't know how I want to run my business, mm -hmm. I cannot encapsulate those APIs. Right. And that means a big experimentation. That's why PaaS is so important, because we foresee enterprises picking certain strategic areas where they think they know something better, where mm -hmm. they think they need to differentiate themselves, mm -hmm. where they see a chance to disrupt their industry, mm -hmm. where they will build software again themselves. Right? Mm -hmm. Departure from the old best practice right. saying, Use standard software, don't customize it, configure it, yeah. work with your vendor to get the next version. But everybody gets the next version, right. right? Now we're in this uncertainty and opportunity where you can differentiate yourself, disrupt your industry mm -hmm. with new software. Mm -hmm. And you have to build it yourself or find someone to help you build it so you're in pass. And mm -hmm. then you sit on top of best practices, which you can encapsulate for BPAS. Mm -hmm. What's yeah. interesting about that is um, if companies are in fact doing what you suggest, and I think, I think it sounds like the right thing, they're going to have to change the nature of how they work, the work they do, the skills they have. Because you know, building software is very different than building cars, essentially. It's, it's very, very different. No yeah. So can companies make this transition? Like what, because obviously, not every company is a technology company. But in this BPAS world, at some level, many companies or cool. more companies will want to be developing software. Mm -hmm. right, Mark. And reason says software eats the world is absolutely correct. If you, as an enterprise, don't have the chance, don't have the platform where you can do if you have to, if you could, 
uh, you get disrupted, like uh, well, the beat, that beaten horse uh, example of the taxi company. Right? Yeah. yeah. As a proper European, I learned to drive when I was 28. So yeah, exactly. I, don't, I, no I couldn't have started that company, no. a taxi company until recently. Yeah. But okay, well, thank you very much, Holger, for coming in. I enjoyed the conversation, and um, hopefully we'll get to meet soon again and talk more about what goes on behind the cloud.